There it goes. Start it. I used to edit them. They take too long. I just put them up. My channel's not that fancy. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Lisa Blackburn. This is my YouTube channel for everything I want to talk about, science and math. And today we're in chemistry class talking about atoms and the periodic table. Uh, I have like 500 subscribers and like there are almost 30,000 views. I want a thousand subscribers like everybody else so that because it will let me put up videos straight if I do. I don't have to record them, then upload them. I used to do that on Facebook. You hear me, YouTube? But, uh, but then with YouTube, you have to have a 1,000 subscribers to do that. But Facebook also takes them down, so that's why I switched to YouTube. And if you search in YouTube, search Miss Lisa, M-I-S-S, Lisa Algebra 2. The reason why it's Miss Lisa and not Mrs. Blackburn is because I started this. I was tutoring, I was doing tutor classes when COVID hit, and all my all my tutor kids had to go home, and I still wanted to get paid. So I started my and they called me Miss Lisa. I was their science and math tutor. So that's why it's Miss Lisa. And if you search Miss Lisa Algebra 2, I'm the one, I'm the only Miss Lisa who tutors Algebra 2. What? You're famous now. I just put a Miss Lisa. It came up without the Algebra 2? Yeah. I'm yeah. getting bigger. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> there used to be other Miss Lisas that would come up first. <laughs> All right. So, how many subscribers do I have now? Can you see? Yeah. Ooh, that's higher than it was. We're getting there. All right, so what we're going to learn about is atoms and the periodic table and the history of the atom. On the test, which is not this Friday, but the next Friday, one of the things you have to do is match the scientists to what they discovered. So we're going to be talking about that. So the, the atom, the, the, where it goes back to originally was ancient Greece. So this idea has been around a long time, just not a new idea. And there was a philosopher, he wasn't even a scientist, named Democritus. And he was standing on a beach one day, and he said, this beach is one thing, but it's made out of many things, grains of sand. I'm one thing. I bet I'm made out of many little things, too. I'm going to call them atoms. It's Greek for indivisible. So when you say the Pledge of Allegiance, you can say, one nation, under God, atoms, with liberty and justice for all, because it means indivisible, means the same thing. So he gave us the term atoms. Let's see if it's going to draw. We'll go with red. Which means indivisible. He was an ancient Greek guy. That's why he looks like the Little Caesars man. And he said that everything was made of atoms. Like beach is made of sand. So that's his model of the atom right there. It looks like sand. Oh, that's, that's his sand right there. Now, Aristotle was also an important old guy from back then. And he said, he, did, he had some wrong ideas about science, but he did say that he thought all matter is uniform. At least he tried. At least he tried. But he had some wrong stuff. He was more famous than Democritus, so some of his wrong ideas lasted for longer than Democritus's right idea. I'm pretty impressed that he just thought of it. Okay, the next guy we're going to talk about is John Dalton. Now, John Dalton uh, was English, and it's in the 1700s. And so we're di we did a big hop from Democritus, ancient Greek, to John Dalton, 1700s. And so what was going on in between? Well, it wasn't that nothing was going on. It was just not real scientific. Instead, we had the alchemists. And the alchemists were basically witches, okay? So these are people who were trying to use potions, spells, witchcraft. Chemistry has a dark past uh, to try to get rich quick. 
their big goal was to change lead into gold. And they would try spells and stuff like that. Now, they were actually important. They gave us a lot of the lab techniques we have today and a lot of the lab equipment. So it wasn't that nothing was going on. It just wasn't real sciencey. It had too much spells in it, okay, and trying to use uh, supernatural means to, to get it going. So then, finally, it started changing really in the 1700s. And um, John Dalton was an English clergyman. Okay, so let's talk about that. So you, n nowadays, we think of the church and science is very far apart, don't we? Most of you don't expect your pastor, priest, or rabbi to be on the cover of Science Weekly, do you? <laughs> Discovering the new thing. But at this time period, a lot of the leaders in science were also leaders in the church for a couple of reasons. One was that there's a Bible verse that says, all of creation declares the glory of God. So a lot of these, these pastors would also study science thinking they could learn about God. And y'all saw that last year in biology. Do you remember who the father of genetics is? Uh, Mendel. Mendel. And what's his other job besides being a famous scientist? He was a monk. He was a monk. You see it? So there were a lot of people like this. And there were other reasons, too. One reason was that a lot of times for a lot of towns, the pastor was the only educated person in the town. So he did more than just preach on Sunday. He gave people law advice. If they were sick and there's no doctor, they'd go talk to him. Is there some medicine or something you know about that could help me? So a lot of the people who were pastors would also study science and they would and they discovered things in science so that's kind of interesting isn't it very different from nowadays because you know we just very very different but that's how it was and so we're going to talk about other people like that too and what he came up with was the atomic theory of matter now he could have he called them he decided that that democritus was right and that everything is made out of indivisible and indestructible atoms. Now he named them atoms as a tilt of the, the, the hat and an acknowledgement of Democritus. So he could have called them Daltons. We could say everything's made out of Daltons, but he named it, he called them atoms instead. Now he was correct. Is everything made out of atoms? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, but he wasn't completely correct. Are atoms indivisible? They can be divided into protons, neutrons, and electrons, can't they? But he was right that the smallest piece of matter that retains the properties of the element is the atom. Gold atoms are like gold. Just like in our video, remember our little barium atom was a blue-green dot? That's the smallest piece of barium that will have the properties of barium. If you break it down into protons, neutrons, and electrons, they're all the same. The, there's no difference in a gold proton and a carbon proton. So they, he was kind of right. Also, atoms can be destroyed in nuclear bombs, and they can be split in nuclear bombs. But he was really close. And so we call this the atomic theory of matter, not the atomic fact of matter, because theories in science are true, and they are adapted. So it's changed some over time, and we'll talk more about what's the law, what's the theory, and what's the idea later when we get to that. Okay, now, the other thing he said, the atoms of a given element are identical. So every gold atom in the world is exactly like every other gold atom in the world in their physical and chemical properties. Atoms of different elements have different chemical and physical properties. And atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios, which means water is H2O, not H2.50. It's whole number ratios. Atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed when they are combined or separated in chemical reactions. And that's true. Now we, now we know more about nuclear reactions, and those are different, but as long as it's chemical reactions, it's correct. One of the things you're going to have to do is match drawings of the models that these guys thought of to what they look like. And his model was called the billiard ball model. A billiard ball is like a pool ball. 
He said that atoms are like little pool balls. Yes, Lay Red. Um, can you tell me what it says on atoms of different elements combined in a simple? Whole number ratios. Whole numbers. Whole number ratios. Let's see then. Okay, so this is the billiard ball model. He said atoms are like little balls. Little balls. <laughs> so that's his. Okay, so then the next thing, a lot of times technology gets ahead of science. And this is what one of the cases. They made a ray gun. How cool is that? Uh, this, just like, you know, in Star Wars, the blaster kind of thing. They had made a ray gun that shot alpha particles, so then they started shooting stuff with it. So then there was this guy, and they figured out with the ray gun that the particles that come out of the ray gun were charged. That if you take a magnet to them, they understood magnets. The, the ancient name used to be lodestones. But they understood magnets, and they understood the opposites attract and likes repel. And they, if they took their beam from their ray gun and they held a magnet up to it, the beam would scoot. Either it would be repelled or attracted toward the magnet. So they figured out that this beam had a charge to it. They knew about electricity. Benjamin Franklin doing his experiments had been around. They knew about electrons, and they knew that there were charges out there. They also knew that atoms were overall neutral. So... That led to the next guy's idea, and this one was a college professor, and his name is J.J. Thompson. And he said that the atom is like plum pudding. You can tell this was a long time ago, because plum pudding is not a popular dessert anymore, is it? <laughs> but it was back then. Now, so you can imagine this like some plum-flavored jello pudding with some raisins in it. The pudding, you got, but what they would have would be plums instead. Now, in England, they call all dessert pudding. So some people say that that's not quite the right way to imagine it, that it would be better to imagine a round muffin with raisins in it. But either way, you got one thing with embedded things in it, okay? So this is our model. This is our dish of pudding that's positive goo with negative plums, and that's what they, and the, they cancel each other out, making it overall neutral, and that's what they thought the atom was like. So how they figured this out is they had a cathode ray tube, how cool is that, that shot particle, positive particles that could be attracted or repelled by a magnet. The plums are the negatively charged electrons, and the goo is positively charged. That's our plum pudding. So I'm going to see if this will scroll. Oh, look at this. It's being so good. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe it's going to start acting bad. All right, so there's our ray gun. I had to make it look like a sci-fi thing. So it had positive charge of goo. Okay, so this, uh, that was his up top, his plum pudding. Okay, so there was another college professor, Ernest Rutherford. And he was going to prove that his buddy J.J. was right. They were college professors, and he was going to prove that he was right. So he set up an experiment, a very famous experiment, called the gold foil experiment. And you saw gold foil in our video yesterday, uh, Monday. Remember the gold beaters making the gold foil? Remember how she could blow that foil when just her breath would move it? And do you remember that the professor in it said that that's only about 12 atoms thick, that gold foil? So it's very, very thin. So the, this is how it was set up. They put the gold foil in the middle of a screen that would flash, glow in the dark, every time it got hit with the ray gun, okay? And, uh, and so imagine that if you had a dish of pudding and you shot a gun at it toward a wall, what would the wall look like afterwards? A big old mess, right? Big old black like, brains, pudding on the wall, big old splat. So that's what they were expecting to get. And it was gonna prove the plum pudding model was right. Ernest was so confident that it was going to work, he didn't even show up for the experiment. He made his grad students do it because it sounded kind of boring being in a dark room and every time the splat hit the glow-in-the-dark screen, having to mark where the light hit. 
Okay, that seemed a little boring, so he decided not to go do that and make the, make the students do it. But what happened was absolutely shocking. He said afterwards that he could not have been more shocked if he had taken a shotgun and shot a piece of tissue paper and the contents of the gun came back and shot him. This was less shocking than that. So prepare to be shocked. Are you ready? This is what happened. 99.9% of all of the ray went straight through and hit the same exact place. 90, are you shocked yet? You should be. Every now and then, like 0.01 time, they would get knocked over to the side. And some of them would go straight back. So it didn't make a splat at all. It made one glow-in-the-dark spot on the screen with a few coming back. This is why it's so shocking, is it proved that the atom is empty space. You think there's something to you, there's not. You are empty space. The only thing that stops one hand from going through the other one is energy, not matter. 99.9% .9 of everything is empty space. Now, do you see why it's shocking? If this room were an atom, the nucleus, the one part of something that's actually there, would be a printed dot on the page. The rest would be the, the atom, empty space. If it was in a stadium, if it was down at, what's our, what did they rename our stadium now? Synovus or something, what's the stadium? It used to be, Truist? Mm -hmm. If it was at the ballpark where the Braves play, the nucleus would be a baseball. The atom would be the whole stadium. The empty space. Do you see how empty that is? It's empty space. So it was extremely shocking to find out that, that everything's nothing. But you knew there was more to you than, than matter, right? Well, nobody's having an existential crisis about this, right? You feel, you feel all right? Okay, so what he came up with was called the planetary model. Planetary, or nuclear model of the atom. He, 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 so his model is what you still see. It's this one on my shirt. That he looked at the, the solar system. The solar system is mostly empty space. It's got the sun in the middle and the planets that orbit around. So he said, well, the atom is mostly empty space with the nucleus in the middle and the electrons orbit around like planets around the sun. Still a very popular representation of the atom, isn't it? You see that a lot. It's not quite right, but it's a good way to think of it. Yes? If you were to, like, let's say you drain all the energy from an object, would you be able to, like, go through it? Yeah. So what if you, like, move them with the same vibrations as, like, an object? That is a big deal in physics. They, they talk about that. So, like, flash. Mm. They talk about that in physics. There is some physics basis of those ideas. Isn't that cool? And there, we're also going to talk about, there's some other science basis in like Nightcrawler and stuff we're going to talk about. Yes? What? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so this was his thing. That, so that's one way of representing, see the electrons going around the nucleus, but the more popular way of doing it is this way that looks like this. That is his planetary model. I'll scroll it up for you all can see. Okay, so that's it right there. That one is his also. Yes? Yes, it's the little positive charge in the middle. So that's his planetary model. So why is this shocking? It's because the atom is empty space. at a ratio of 100,000 to one. Absolutely empty space. So he came up with the positively charged nucleus, and nucleus is Latin for little nut. So there's just a little nut of matter in the middle of the atom, the nucleus, the little nut, okay? So then another guy came along, Niels Bohr in 1913, and he figured out that the electrons can only hang out in certain energy levels. 
that that's the energy that makes the atom have structure is the electrons hanging out in these energy levels. The symbol for energy in science is a capital E. If you don't know that, be sure to write that what that E means, it's energy. So the electrons hang out in these energy levels and there's no stairs between them. They have to hop and that hop is called a quantum leap. We, Dr. Morrison talked about that in our video yesterday. The, and that quantum leap takes a certain amount of energy called a quantum. So the electrons have to hop between energy levels and those are quantum leaps. Have you heard of a quantum leap before? Yes, Jenny? It's the, uh, the second one. I, I don't know what that word is. Oh, little nut? Okay. Sorry, this pen doesn't write real good. Little nut. Little nut. All right. So the next idea that came in, so this is the Bohr model. And we're going to draw Bohr models. That's what it looks like. Okay. The next people who came along, I'm going to tell the story. And we're going to back up a little bit. Start talking about the scientist's mama first. Okay. So there was a very famous woman scientist who worked with her husband, Pierre. And it was Pierre and Marie Curie. And they started understanding about radioactivity before anybody else. They were um, going to, and back then, the, where you presented your science knowledge was in Paris at this group of scientists. So Pierre was going to go and explain to the scientists about what they had discovered. And on the way, he was hit by a cab and killed. Now, this was back when cabs were often, they, they, I think they had cars at this time, but this one was, was a horse-drawn cab. And so he was trampled to death by a horse. Well, they had a rule women were not allowed to talk to the men scientists at their little party. So they decided that she was the only scientist in the world who understood this now that her husband was dead. So they changed the rules, and they, uh, she was the first woman to ever speak to the scientist. She became the most famous scientist in the world, first woman. So, she, so we, all of these are mostly men who discovered all this stuff, but we got a woman, Marie Curie. Well, her and her husband had daughters uh, before he died, and one of them became a very famous movie actress. But the other one followed in her mother's footsteps and became a scientist, Irene Jolet Curry. She, her mom was the most famous scientist in the world, so she didn't get rid of the, the Curry. She hyphenated with her husband's name, Jolet. He was her lab partner, just like how her mom and dad were lab partners. And they had another part lab partner named Chadwick. Well, so we're jumping ahead to her, and they discovered in their lab that there was a third subatomic particle, the proton, the electron, but they discovered the neutron. Have you ever heard of the neutron? So Irene Jolet Curry and her husband and lab partner figured out there was another particle, the same size as a proton, but neutral, called the neutron. Now... The next thing that came along was they figured out that those electrons don't hang out in nice, perfect, little, pretty circles like they did in the Bohr model. Instead, they hang out in clouds where there is a certain probability that they will be. Okay? And that's called the electron cloud model or quantum theory. There's a lot of scientists who helped contribute to this, but one of the main ones was Heisenberg. And so he's the one who we're going to attach his name to it. <laughs> Excuse me? Neutral, N-E-U-T-R-A-L. Okay, and so what he figured out is that electrons can be thought as particles or waves, and really Einstein had a lot to do with this too. The dual nature of matter. And there's a relationship between electron energy and light. And then another thing that he, that he in particularly thought of was he figured out that you cannot know the exact location of an electron and its speed at the same time. If you find its location, you have to stop it, and then you don't know its speed. And if you know its speed, it's already moved too fast, and you can't know its location. So I always ask kids, what did Heisenberg figure out? And they say, I don't know. And I say, you're right. Very good. Because that's what he figured out. You can't know the speed and location at the same time. So he's famous for saying, I don't know. 
All right. So that's Heisenberg. And this is what the orbital, these are our, where the electrons hang out. The clouds are orbitals. Some of them are sphere shaped. Some of them are shaped like these balloons. They're called dumbbell shaped. There's other ones that kind of look like pluses. There are some that are just little fuzzies. So we're gonna do a whole unit on that later. Um, okay, but there's this relationship between light and electron energy, and that was in our video when it would go whoop, whoop. Remember the little electrons jumping down and giving off color? Do you remember that part of the video? But it's not just visible light. If you remember, the first light that the, they found was UV. It wasn't even visible. It was a little UV hump where it went whoop, as it, in our video. So the whole light spectrum, is, how you remember it is this. Ronald McDonald is very ugly, extra gross. So the lowest, they all travel at the speed of light. They all are made by the sun and other stars, but they have different frequency and energy. So the lowest frequency, the biggest wavelength, the lowest energy is radio waves. So Ronald is for radio. And radio also includes TV rays, and um, so it's not just radio. Uh, McDonald is microwaves, microwaves, and that's what your phone works on. So, you're, so that's a little controversial. Some people think microwaves can cause cancer, and now we got them on our phones right up by our ear, and now with 5G, it's going to be even more high energy. So that's where the controversy comes in. So Ronald McDonald is, is infrared, that's heat, heat energy, is, uh, very, is visible, that's Roy G. Biv, the rainbow, ugly is UV, can I write UV or do I have to write out ultraviolet? Do y'all know that UV is ultraviolet? I'm writing UV. And, uh, so that's, that's what tans your skin and gives you skin cancer, UV, and then extra is x-rays, and gross is gamma rays. You know what turns Bruce Banner into the Hulk? Gamma. Now we're going to do a whole unit on this, but we can go ahead and at least learn the spectrum. Any questions about that? Okay, the next thing. So we talked about sort of the story of the atom. We're going to talk about the story of how the periodic table was discovered. Okay, remember I told you there were a lot of these guys were ministers and stuff like that? Our next guy, no, not so much. This guy is Dmitry Mendeleev, and his story is he was Russian, and he was a grad student. And uh, his friends wanted him to go to the bar and drink and play cards. It's a typical college student, right? So he was like, no, I got too much to do. They said, I'll bring it with you. So what he did is he wrote on playing cards. That's why there's cards right there. He wrote on, he took a set of playing cards and he took them and put paper on them. And he wrote everything that was known about all the elements on these playing cards. And he'd take them to the bar and he'd spread them out and he'd rearrange them because he could see there were patterns in the elements and he wanted to discover it. And he'd rearrange it and rearrange it while he was at the bar. Okay, And he discovered it. There is a pattern in the elements that is found in the periodic table. So he did not invent the periodic table. The patterns have always been there. He discovered the periodic table. Okay, So he, he made it. He put it in order by atomic weight. And he was able to predict elements that had not even been discovered yet. They're going to discover an element, it's going to weigh this much, it's going to have these properties, and then they would discover it, and he looked psychic. So it was really cool. Now, he was a young guy, so everybody imagine a young guy, drinking guy at the bar, you see? Well, the only, when he got old, they had photography, not when he was young. So you always see pictures of him in the science book where he's like 80 years old, he's got a beard down to here, and he is not the young guy who invented this stuff. So, um, so just get it in your head right if you ever see his picture. Okay, so he figured out there are repeating predictable patterns if you arrange the um, elements correctly. So that's what he would work on at the bar. He arranged it by atomic weight. Now, the reason why 
is they hadn't discovered the proton yet. So he did it by weight and he discovered the periodic table. He discovered those patterns. Now, so we have a song to remember Mendeleev. Okay, so you've got a part. I'll sing it to you. Now, this, back in the 1800s, when people would go to a bar, they liked to sing. And you probably don't know much about this, but if you've seen Beauty and the Beast, remember Gaston's song? No one spits like Gaston, no one da 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 da. That's what the bar songs were like. They were like real, people would just get drunk and sing. It was fun. Okay, so Mendeleev's song is a, the, in that spirit of the bar song, okay? And so uh, your part is why I go like this, you go, Mendeleev! Okay, you ready? Who told the elements where to go? Mendeleev. That was not very enthusiastic. We need more enthusiasm here. Let's try it again. Who told the elements where to go? Mendeleev! Who put them down in columns and in rows? Mendeleev, who, this is the touching part, who was willing, who was able to make a periodic table, who told the elements where to go? Mendeleev. Pretty good. I think we need it one more time. Who told the elements where to go? Mendeleev, who put them down in columns and in rows? Mendeleev, who was willing, who was able to make a periodic table, who told the elements where to go? Mendeleev, you gotta have your stein of whatever, Mendeleev. Okay, so now we can remember, Mendeleev, he told the elements where to go. Okay, so he, but he wasn't quite right. Remember, he did it by weight. Well, then came along a guy named Henry Mosley. Henry Mosley, okay? And he figured out by this time they had discovered the proton so he rearranged it by atomic number. It's the whole number that tells you how many protons. So it's like these numbers right here, 11, 12, those are the atomic numbers. Now, he was probably the smartest person who's ever lived. Have you heard of him? No, no. and this is why. He was a grad student in England and World War I broke out, and he got drafted to go to the war. Well, his professors contacted the government and said, no, this is the smartest person ever, probably smarter than Einstein. They, they said, he's a student, but he's smarter than us, and we're the professors. You cannot send him to war to get killed. So what do you think the government of England did? Sent him right to the front line. Guess what happened to him? got killed immediately. So then they went, oops, maybe we shouldn't have killed the smartest person ever. Maybe he would have been useful for the government or the war effort or saving us from, from, from the Germans. So then England, they made a new law, too late, but they made it, that if you're a brilliant scientist, you don't have to go to the front lines in war. So all the pictures of Henry Mosley He's a young, little, chubby-cheeked, fresh-faced college kid, because he died. He didn't, we never get to find out what he did next. Okay, then the final thing on the periodic table, there's a guy called Glenn Seaborg, and he was alive, I know, in the 90s at least, maybe even this century, so, uh, so he's a more recent addition guy. But he figured out to pull out this bottom part, so that's what he did, is he pulled out the, the actinides and the lanthanides. So he arranged it with the bottom section. Now those are just a little bit different and they belong together. Okay, the story of radioactivity is very much tied up with the story of the atom and the periodic table. <laughs> so, radioactivity was first discovered by a guy named Henry Becquerel. And what he was doing is he was doing experiments with glow-in-the-dark rocks. That sounds fun, doesn't it? And what he had is he had some photography film, and he was taking this glow-in-the-dark rock and seeing if the, the glow-in-the-dark was strong enough to make a picture on the film. 
Everybody got, got the vision of his experiment? So it's Friday, it's quitting time. He throws his glow-in-the-dark rocks in a drawer in the lab, puts the unopened film that he hadn't used yet in the drawer, goes off for the weekend, comes back, and when he goes to resume the experiment on Monday, the film has all been exposed. He said it was like it had been held up to the sun. So it turns out that those glow-in-the-dark rocks weren't just glow-in-the-dark. They had uranium in them, and they were radioactive. So on accident, he discovered radioactivity. Now, he was scientific about it, and he followed it up with more experiments, but don't get the idea that everything in science was figured out by going through this scientific method. There's a lot of things that we discover accidentally. So he accidentally discovered radioactivity, and they had a great time with it. They figured out you could do x-rays. They, uh, they did x-rays of like a lady's hand wearing rings. They would dance behind an x-ray screen. It looked like a skeleton's dancing. They had so much fun with it. They had no idea it could cause cancer. It was a, it was a great time. Probably, yeah, a lot of them died of, of the, these early scientists died of radiation poisoning and cancer, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so he discovered x-rays. So he had a friend, Marie Curie, we're back to her. And I already told you, she uh, was, looked at Henry Becquerel's um, research and she understood radioactivity. Her husband died, he was hit by the taxi cab, and she was the first woman to be allowed to speak to the scientific community. Yay! And she discovered elements, she discovered radioactive elements, radium and polonium she named after her native Poland. She was from Poland, lived in France. Okay, so then, that's her story. Then, the next thing that sort of happened on the, we learned about this calendar, was Lisa Meitner. She worked with Otto Hahn and Fritz, they call him Fritz though, Fritz Streisman on radioactive elements. And World War II breaks out. So, Lisa Meitner uh, was working in Germany with her lab partners, and Hitler comes to power. She's Jewish. So they take all their money, uh, her lab partners, Otto and Fritz, they take their money, they sell their jewelry, they get her out of there safe to Switzerland. Okay, so she got out of there. But they continued with the lab experiments because they weren't Jewish, and they would send her their results. Now, she was Jewish by ethnic ethnicity, but her religion was Christianity. I've had that confuse students. Does that make sense to you? Just because your ethnicity is Jewish does not mean that you don't believe in Jesus. Okay? Now, do you think Hitler cared who she believed in? No. Not one bit. Okay? So, it didn't matter. She had to get out of there. So, uh, I'm, we're in her story. She's not dead. She's in Switzerland. She's safe. So they did some experiments, and they didn't understand what they got. She's celebrating Christmas. Her nephew comes to celebrate Christmas with her, and they got the lab results from her partners, and, they, and she figured out what had happened. And accidentally, they had split the atom. So later, they wrote up the paper. They couldn't put her name on it because she's Jewish, and, and so they got all the credit. But from that splitting the atom, she knew about Einstein's e equals mc squared, and this was going to make the path to making a nuclear bomb. Okay, So uh, they did not give her credit at that time. Later on, after the war, they made a museum and didn't even mention that they made it totally like the guys had figured it out without her. Recently, like I'm talking 90s, early 2000s, they finally corrected the museum and are giving her her credit because she figured it out, not them, that they had split the atom. So, um, but, and so she was fine. She lived out her life. She escaped Hitler. Yay, Lisa Meitner. Okay, so she figured out they had split the atom. Okay, nuclear fission. Now, nuclear fission is splitting an atom. Nuclear fusion is putting an atom together. You can use both to make bombs, but you need to know the difference. So well, this is what I want everybody to do. Imagine a fish. Okay, you got a fish. Now imagine your hand is a knife 
and you cut the fish in half. So fission, fission is splitting the atom. Fusion is putting little atoms together. And that's what's happening in the sun and other stars. So alpha particles hit the radioactive element and split it and then nuclear fusion. Now, so then, well, remember we're fighting Hitler. Germany went to war with the world, and it was close. That's pretty shocking, isn't it? They didn't go just, other countries go to war with a country. Nope. Germany went to war with the world, and it was close. Okay, so Hitler's in power. He's killing Jews. He's a crazy fella. He's trying to use science to win the war. So we're, we decide we need to make a nuclear bomb to fight Hitler. So we had the Manhattan Project, and they got the most brilliant scientists who were learning about nuclear things to go out to the desert and make a bomb. They were afraid to do it. They were afraid that how a bomb works is one atom splits, and then it makes particles that split two more. And then those two split four more, and those four split on and on and on, growing exponentially. They didn't know if it would stop. If they made a bomb, could it be stopped or would it blow up the whole world? They also didn't know if they made a bomb, if it would ignite the oxygen in the atmosphere and burn up the world. And they tested it anyway. That's, pretty, that's how scared they were of Hitler. They are deciding it is better to end the world than let Hitler be in charge of it. That's pretty shocking, isn't it? But they thought they were safe with it because of this guy, Enrico Fermi. He is the first one who was able to control a chain reaction. So he was very developmental in making the bomb, the nuclear bomb. Um, now, one scientist who was not there is Albert Einstein um, to control the chain reaction. This is why. Einstein said he would not help make the bomb because he is also Jewish. And he said that throughout the Jews' history, they have been persecuted. If you've ever been to a Passover Seder, there's one part about, they tried to kill us, but they didn't. We're still here. Mazel tov. Let's drink. So uh, over and over again throughout the Jews' history, they have been trying to wipe them out. You know, if you know about Queen Esther, trying to wipe them out. The Egyptians killing all the babies, trying to wipe them out. And Hitler trying to wipe them out. And, and so what uh, Einstein said is if we make a bomb, eventually someone's going to try to use it to wipe out the Jews. And I can't be a part of that. Does that, you see that? So it was based on his idea of E equals MC squared. But he did not go work on the Manhattan Project. Yes? Is that because of the chain? That says control. Oh, control A, it should say, yes, a chain reaction. Wrong word. A chain reaction. Chain reaction. So, um, and he was right. Right now, if you follow the news, Iran is trying real hard to get a bomb. What do they want to do with it? Blow up Israel. They say uh, no Jews from the, from the river to the sea. They want to kill all the Jews in Israel. So he was right that... They're trying to get a bomb, and that's what it's for. They don't want it. They say that they want nuclear power, but that's not it. Yes? A chain, a chain reaction. Chain reaction. Okay. <laughs> so the sun is nuclear fission. It's what powers the sun and other stars. Okay, so the atom. The atom has subatomic particles. It's got protons. What charge are protons? You learned this in physical science. Positive. What charge are neutrons? Neutral. And what charge are electrons? Negative. Protons and neutrons are big, but uh, electrons are tiny, and they spin. There are more subatomic particles, things like quarks and mesons and gluons, and there's a bunch of them. You'll learn about them in physics. Where a lot of the research is being done for that is the Large Hadron Collider, which is over in Europe. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff coming out of that. Remember I told you about Nightcrawler? They've been able to kind of get electrons to do that, to, to just travel from one place to another without go, traveling. So, so we're getting closer to that whole beam me up Scotty thing. That's kind of cool, isn't it?
They did an experiment with it at Oak Ridge in Tennessee and then also there at the Collider. So, fun times to live. We had a lot of cool sciences going on. Okay, if you remember Niels Bohr, he came up with the Bohr model that the electrons hang out on energy levels. And we're going to draw his models. Now, his models only worked through about element 20. <coughs> you know he wasn't the final word in atoms. We got the electron cloud model now that's much more correct. But we are going to learn the skill of making Bohr models. So that is what this is on the board. This is for our Bohr model maker. So let's make a few of these. What you do first is you look on the periodic table, pretend it's still down. You look at the atomic number, the whole number for the element. And for hydrogen, it's one. For helium, two. Lithium, three. <coughs> Four, five, six. Okay. You draw how the number is the number of protons. You draw that in the nucleus. So there's my one proton. And then it has the same number of electrons. There's my electron. So that's one way of doing a Bohr model of hydrogen. So here it is on the board. And on one proton, one electron. Now helium has two. We'll give it two pluses there for its nucleus. And it has two electrons. Now, helium also has two neutrons. So, helium is really like this. How you know that, it's just like when you did your homework, you subtract the mass from the, the number from the mass, and you find out that there's two neutrons. How do we feel about that? Good? Okay. So, everybody try. Oh, I need to do lithium for you. So, let's do lithium. It's got three protons, and it's got three electrons. The first two go on the first energy level. The next one bounces up to the next one. The first energy level can only hold two electrons. So there is lithium. So over here, I would do it over here. Lithium has four neutrons three protons, three electrons. You all right about that? Have you ever done Bohr models before in physical science? I see some yeses, good. All right, I'm gonna leave those for now. We're gonna do a little lab with this tomorrow so we're, you can work on these more later. Okay, ions. Atoms aren't always neutral like the ones we're drawing on the Bohr model. Electrons can get lost. They can be rubbed off or they can be captured and it can get extra electrons and that gives it a charge so ions are charged atoms electrons are negative if an atom loses an electron it becomes positively charged if an atom gains an electron it becomes negatively charged now there's a special name for positive and negative ions that is easy to remember if you just remember that cats are great. Cats are wonderful, positive little creatures. So a positive ion is a cat ion. A cat ion. So everybody just think about how great cats are, how positive they are, and you can get a cat ion. Now I know some of you are dog people, and you're protesting this idea in your heart of cats being positive, right? But I can, I'm going to convince you. The opposite of a cation is not a dog ion. It's an anion. And we're going to remember that by fire ants. And we all agree that fire ants are terrible. <laughs> they bite you. They give you a little place that looks like a zit. You could have an allergic reaction and die. So fire ants are terrible, right? They're negative. So anions are negative. Cations are positive. Good with that idea? Cations and anions. All right. The next part in your notes is just like your worksheet you've already done. I put the key to that on Canvas. Oh, no. Go ahead and talk to the county again. Got to go talk to the county. Tell them my stupid board. All right. This is what we're going to do. Don't fear. We have a plan here.
Oh, did y'all write this? The, the outermost electrons are called valence electrons. So like this one with lithium, this one that's on the outside is the valence electron. These two on the inside ring, they don't do much. It's only the outside ones that do anything in chemistry. So they get a special name, valence. Now people up north say valence, and I have heard some people call them valence electrons, but I'm Southern, they're valence to me. So valence electrons, why do we have a big old lightning bolt there? Okay, so next. All right, so y'all can fill that out. You know how to do that. Now, isotopes. Ions are charged atoms. Isotopes are fat ones or skinny ones, okay? Atoms can have more or less neutrons. They can be fat or thin. Some isotopes, especially fat ones, can be radioactive. They're so fat they fall apart. They, when they fall apart, they shed radioactivity particles like alpha, beta, and gamma. We're going to do a whole unit on that for unit three. So we're not going to worry too much about it right now. All right, now, notice I got two cats. Here, are, these are our positive cats. One is fat, one is thin. Are they both cats? Yes. So it doesn't change the identity of the atom to be an isotope. It's just how fat they are, how many neutrons they have. <laughs> okay, last thing. Oh, we're doing good on time. Even with Alex's report. Okay, what we're going to do is part of the test is you have to know the areas of the periodic table. We're going to talk more about periodicity and periodic trends in our next unit. But we're going to go ahead and learn the areas of the periodic table, and you need to color them. On the test, you will match the areas to a periodic table just like this. Now, don't be overwhelmed when I show it to you. Let me break it down and teach you one bit at a time. Okay. <laughs> so the first the way the periodic table is divided is metals and nonmetals. What I want you to do first on your periodic table is put your pencil right here next to boron. And I want you to draw a stair step going down. See my gold stair step right here? That stair step divides the metals and the nonmetals. The metals are from the stair step over to the left. The nonmetals are from the stair step over to the right. So draw your stair step and then label metals and nonmetals. Okay, can you just do that? Don't get overwhelmed by looking at the whole thing. Right now, just draw your stairs and label metals and nonmetals. I'm going to scroll up now that we said metals and nonmetals. Okay, the stairs is right here. It's this gold stairs. Metals and nonmetals, or that gold stairs is what divides them. Let's see if it's on this periodic table. Sometimes they darken it. Oh, it's black on this one. See that the black stairs? That's what you're drawing in. Okay, metals and nonmetals. Now, there are certain things that have properties of both metals and nonmetals. They're kind of like half, and they're called metalloids. Metalloids, and those are the ones that touch the stairs. So notice I colored them blue. Everything that is touching that stairs, I colored blue, those are metalloids. Does that one make sense? Now that, we are nerds, we are science geeks, and we debate about what's a metalloid and what's not. So if you get to college and you have a teacher that says, polonium's not a metalloid, or whatever, just go with it. Just know we argue about this. But in general, the ones that touch the stairs are the metalloids. Okay. okay, the next one is some of these columns have special names. The first one is called the noble gases. Some of y'all did your reports on noble gases. Helium and hydrogen. Well, neon, hydrogen's kind of not. But helium and neon, all this very first column is the noble gases. Notice that things can be more than one thing. Uh, osmium 
is a noble gas and a metalloid and a non-metal. So that's okay. Things can be more than one. The next column right here next to it is the halogens. Halogen means salt former, and these are in salt like sodium chloride. Chloride, and you know there's other salts besides sodium chloride. You know there's Epsom salt. Y'all know about this stuff. You're in the gourmet salt generation. Y'all know about the different salts. Sea salt. Himalayan pink salt. Okay. All right, so the halogens are the next column here. This very first column that I colored gray is the alkali earth metals. I mean, alkali metals. Alkali means basic, not acidic. So these, when they're added to water, make a base. Okay, so they, these are the alkali metals. These are the alkaline earth metals. So they both, alkali and alkaline, mean the same thing. It means they make a base when they're added to water. You know how it's real in style to drink basic water now. Y'all know about that? It's supposed to be good for your health. So I was reading about Paulding County, and we have our own water treatment plant, and they add base to it so that our tap water is all fancy and basic. We have nice water, Paulding County. All right, so this one is the alkaline earth metals. Now, this rectangle right here that I colored red is called the transition metals. This red rectangle is the, is the transition metals. The ones, the actinides and the lanthanides are the ones down here on the bottom. The ones that start LA are the lanthanides. I colored them black. The ones that start AC are the actinides, and I colored them yellow. There's one thing that I left off that I want you to add. Some people call this little triangle other metals. Whoops, I rolled it. That little triangle right there, they're not transition metals. They are metals because they are to the left of the stairs, so they're called other metals. Lead is in there. Tin. Some of the ones that are pretty famous metals. <coughs> All right, that's the notes. Test on it, not Friday, but the next Friday. That's not hard, is it? I think this is our easiest test we've had yet. Talk louder. Okay, now we've got 20 minutes. What you're going to do is a worksheet. Atoms, cations, anions, oh my. So this will be part of our, our next packet. Uh, you can sit and work on it by yourself. You can sit and work on it with your lab partner. You can sit and work on it with your desk partner. I don't care. But are we packing up and getting ready to go? No. So work on this worksheet. Get it done and you won't have any homework. Like, share, subscribe. Science is great. I don't think so. Here it goes. All right. All right. Take one and pass it. Oh, let's answer the daily warm up. I bet y'all know it. What is the charge of a proton? Positive. Neutron. Neutral. Electron. Negative. Atom. Negative. Neutral. Ion. Plus or minus? Number Plus or minus? Plus or Yes. It's the new one I just gave you. This is, this is what you should have on your new paper. That one that was due, you turned in on Friday. But some people asked me to leave it up there because they had missed it. So this one has already been turned in, graded. You've got zero if you didn't turn it in. This is our new one, but I left it up because I had people yesterday email me while on digital day asking me to leave this up here, so I did.